we were on the, you know, back in those days, every Friday you got delivered these MLS books and that's what was on the market. It wasn't a computer. It wasn't, you know, it was, you know, these books that put ink all over your fingers. There were no cell phones. There were no fax machines. We had one of the crummiest copier machines you could even imagine. And, uh, uh, and I went and got a pager. Why did I get a pager? Well, because uh, you'd come back to the office and there'd be a stack of pink slips there for people that had called you. And I didn't really want to come back at the end of the day and have a stack of pink slips to go home. I wanted to go home and see my wife and our little boy. And so I got a pager so people could start paging me instead. And I'd stop at a 7-Eleven and call them back. Well, the other agents in the office thought that was the strangest thing they'd ever seen. And then I forced my dad to buy a f the first fax machine. Welcome to Winning Strategies Playbook, the podcast where we welcome business leaders, CEOs, and industry experts to discuss the rise to the top, building wealth, and real estate insights. Here's your host, Jeremy Spann. Welcome to Winning Strategies Playbook. And for more information on this podcast and other podcasts, go to myexperiencedrealtor.com. That's experience with an ED, myexperiencedrealtor.com. Click on podcasts, scroll down to whatever episode you're looking for. You can click on the YouTube button, the Spotify, Amazon, iTunes, any preferred platform, or you can listen to it directly from the website and you can click on the read more to find out more information like incredible guests like we have today. I'm very excited as the audience knows, the SPAN Group carries our license under Briggs Freeman Sotheby's International Realty. And we have with us today, the CEO and none other than himself, Robbie Briggs. Thank you for coming today, Robbie. Hey, Jeremy, thank you. This is great. You do a great job here. I didn't know you were a TV personality. <laughs> I don't know about TV. I've got a face for radio, as the yeah, old you, joke you goes, do, right? Yeah, you do have a face for radio. <laughs> I mean, I outpunted my coverage. Like everybody uh -huh. always asks Laura, like, you're really pretty. He's really not. Did you lose a bet? And she goes, well, I had been drinking. And I said, well, there's an annulment period of 90 days. So you weren't drunk for 90 days. So <laughs> there how, you go. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks. Yeah. Got through the holidays, strangest holidays I think we've ever had with, you know, COVID and nobody being able to get together, but it was great. We all zoomed. We all saw each other. And uh, our youngest daughter came down to the beach with us and we had a good time. How Which about beach? you? Which we went down to Port Aransas this year, oh, just nice. just a place where you could drive down and, and hang out. And we stayed at a place called Cinnamon Shores, which is a nice little development. That's wonderful. Yeah. How about you? Man, we this was, so 2020, as we know, has been kind of a bittersweet, yeah. weird. Really weird. Really weird year. Uh, as a matter of fact, I like to call it the post-pandemic riding, protesting election year trifecta of 2020. <laughs> and then my friend, retired four-star Marine Corps General John Allen said, don't forget about the fires and hurricanes. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. So um, dear, prior to the pandemic, we purchased a house in Pagosa Springs, Colorado, Yeah, up in the mountains. And we... Uh, split our time back and forth. We've gotten our business practice down to where we can be anywhere and operate our business. And why I really wanted that we've never really been able to accomplish this, have all the family get together. So uh -huh. my dad, James and Carol, Laura's parents, Maggie, everybody flew in and we had an incredible white Christmas Great. Yeah, they had good snow this year in Colorado. Oh, man, it was really good snow. As yeah. a matter of fact, getting James and Carol back to the airport <laughs> was a three-hour. Normally, it's a 45-minute drive to uh -huh. Durango Airport, and it was a three-hour drive. And that was one wow. of the reasons we picked Pagosa is because Durango Airport has three direct flights of DFW a day. Yeah. So if I've yeah. got to be back for a client or something, I can be back by 10, what is it, I think 10 a.m., 2 p.m., or 8 p.m. on any given day. Yeah. And so there's been many a times I get a call and just run down to the airport, jump on a plane, and then maybe the next day fly back or like this week, I flew in early Monday morning. And then after I record my last episode today, I'll run back to the airport to go back up there. Getting Laura back is literally like she'd rather be waterboarded in Guantanamo Bay than leave 
that mountain. She uh -huh. loves it. She absolutely loves it. Yeah, I can imagine. It's great. Yeah. So before we get going, as you know, my father-in-law, James Van Hook, yes. says, we must start every one of these off with a joke. And he, I have so disappointed him because he, knowing me and my personality, uh -huh. he was really expecting jokes to be risque. And I, on purpose, I'm trying to disappoint him with every joke. <laughs> so I got one for you. And I think this is fitting for real estate. All right. Very good. Robbie, knock, knock. Who's there? Figs. Figs? Figs who? Fix your doorbell. It's not working. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Way to go, Jeremy. Now, that's a little risque, isn't it? <laughs> maybe, 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 right? I'm giving everybody good dad yeah, jokes to yeah, use yeah, with yeah, their yeah. kids. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's great. It good. is great. So um, for the audience, um, Robbie bought Laura's family's real estate company back in 2015. Correct. I was not in real estate at the time, and it was really kind of funny, is in 2016, Laura drug me into this thing kicking and screaming. And I didn't want to do it, so I got my license on October 1st of 2016. And after the first 90 days, if you would have gone back to Jeremy getting out of the Marine Corps almost two and a half decades ago and said, you're going to be in real estate and you're going to love it, I would have been like, what, huh? No way, no how. Mm -hmm. And after my first 90 days, and especially working for you, I, I, where has this been my whole life? Well, you were a natural on so many different levels, Jeremy. I mean, you're a people person. You're so fun to be around. And yet you're also smart, creative, and innovative. And so the, it's a natural for you. You've got a good business sense. You've got a good business mind. And yet you care about people. And Laura is a, an amazing balance to your talents. So you'll make a great team. And you've added good people to your team to make it even stronger. So congratulations. I'm going to take that part where you said I was smart. I'm going to put it on a loop. And I'm going to play it for Laura over and over and over <laughs> and over and over so she can hear that. Laura, when you listen to this one, that was out of the words of the CEO of Briggs Freeman Sotheby's. I'm a smart guy. I'm a smart guy. Well, it's funny. Well, you're also smart. Alec. So oh, that, that kind of goes together with it. Well, that's actually how I'm able to sell so much real estate uh -huh. is people will buy or sell their real estate uh -huh. just so I'll shut up. Yeah, there right? you go. They're there like, you go. if you'll just stop talking. I'll go ahead and I'll buy. I'll go ahead and just, do Where it. do I sign? Yeah, but you have to love the power of Sotheby's, right? Um, my first true experience of Sotheby's after you came in and made a presence in Fort Worth was the global networking event. Right. In May of 2016 in Las Vegas. And Laura's like, hey, come with me to this. And there was, what, over two, 3,000 yeah. agents right. from all over the world. And so, yes, naturally buying. And you being shy, you met a few of them. I think I got the business card of almost every single one of them. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think you did, Jeremy. And I, but here's what, this is what's really interesting. And this is the power of Southern Beach, right? Is Naturally, buying and selling real estate in your local market, you want to have someone that's the best of the best and captures that brand. But really what stuck out to me was learning about the referral system, that over a billion dollars worth of real estate a year go from office to office referrals. And I became fascinated watching that. So that was really when Laura brought me in is really where I wanted to focus because I was like, man, you've got some really incredible professionals all over the planet. And I wanted to know who these professionals were in every single market. And after that first 90 days, we've spent hundreds of thousands of miles flying to different markets. I don't even know how many thousands of hours I've spent on the phone getting to know other agents. And in 20. 18 and 2019, I believe the SPAN group was responsible for the most outgoing referrals in Briggs Freeman. Hope in 2020 is also taking the title again. And that's where I wanted to be because, yes, I know my market, right? But I wanted people that were going to buy or family or friends that they cared about buying in other markets to have someone equally as good to deliver that value, right? Right. right. So talk, talk to us about that global brand of Sotheby's. Well, you know... Um my father started our company in 1960. 
So last year we were 60 years old. Uh, and in 2010, actually in 20, 2008, uh, the market went in a nosedive. As you know, Lehman Brothers went out of business, yada, yada, yada. And no one in Dallas and Fort Worth were buying big, expensive houses. They were sitting just dormant, except we were seeing some people, uh, for instance, really wealthy Mexicans were coming up to our area to evade uh, the cartels. And we were seeing some Europeans making investments and occasionally Asians. And so it really occurred to me that nobody in Monterey, Mexico or Frankfurt, Germany knew who Robbie Briggs was or Williams True or Ali Beth Allman or any of us. They were unknowns. They may be really well known in their markets, but they're not known worldwide. Sotheby's is known worldwide. And I felt like if we were going to take advantage of the individual international business, then we needed to be part of an international company. And so that's when I bought the franchise uh, for Sotheby's International Realty. And uh, over the last several years, expanded from the Dallas office to South Lake to Fort Worth to Plano Frisco. And uh, now we really cover North Texas. Our ranch and land department goes in any direction, probably three hours from uh, the Metroplex. So uh, th that being said, uh, we had been involved and I had always been involved in relocation and been very interested in the relocation, but we belong to different organizations. And those organizations, in a way, they were known by the industry, but not by the buyers and sellers. Uh, you know, I actually started a organization called Luxury Portfolio, which, um, you know, some of our competitors are still involved in, and I loved it. But you'd have several members involved in it in each market. And so every single time, no matter how much you worked it, like you've been doing, tra traveling the country, you really wouldn't know if those referrals would come to you because the HR person that's actually looking at placing those uh, referrals a lot of the time, they just open a book and they'd send the referral and you'd land in a company and who knows what agent would actually get it. And that's the way a lot of relocation business is done. When I started thinking about Sotheby's, knowing that these were some of the best agents in the world in each one of the major markets, they're not going to send their referrals to anybody but Sotheby's. So our first year uh, of being part of the organization, our referral business went up like 40%. Today, it's up 200, 300% because over those years, people like Jeremy they go and make relationships all across the country. I do as well. I'm part of a, the 10 top Sotheby's broker owners. And we regularly, uh, before the pandemic, we met twice a year in person, but currently we're meeting once a month, Zoom. And I will tell you, you know, this pandemic, as we started out this conversation, 2020 was one of the strangest years we've ever experienced. And when it first hit, when COVID first shut us down in March, we didn't know what kind of year we were going to have. We didn't know how to handle it. Fortunately, the real estate business, and particularly those of us that are part of Sotheby's, already had virtual capabilities, uh, online capabilities, but um, we, didn't, we didn't almost know how to apply them. And I met we were meeting once a week our these top brokers and sharing ideas and sharing marketing platforms and sharing uh, ways to have virtual open houses and virtual showings and and uh, new ways to do video and new ways to do 3D and all these things. Um, I promise the amount of support that we gave each other got us kick-started faster than any other group. And our agents ended up, last year was one of the best years we've ever had. Uh, so um, that's just part of why 
Sotheby's is so important to me. Uh, but it particularly, I encourage all of our agents to really get to know the brokers, particularly if if they're seeing their cl- their clients coming in from a certain market, then they really need to know. And and it's not just that, oh, I can pit, look through a book and find an agent. I know these people. I know Joe Sillick as a fantastic agent in Los Angeles and Chris Klug in, in Aspen and just go, I mean, in Vail. No, Aspen. And uh, Ty Stockton in Vail and on and on and on. I mean, and, and uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago we had – Nikki Field, uh, one of the top agents in the country, but also in Manhattan, uh, also with a top agent from uh, Atlanta and a top agent from Utah uh, on a panel in our office about what what they're doing to prepare for 2021 and how they're going to take their business to the next level. And we shared that on our Zoom Monday morning meeting. And uh, it's that kind of input and sharing and support that we give one another on a regular basis, and there's nothing like it. Man, you just mentioned two names that are friends of mine. Ty Stockton. Yeah, he's a great guy. I love that guy. And as a matter of fact, when we joined Sotheby's, the very next day he called, and he got on a plane and came down and spoke to our group on the very first uh, Monday morning meeting that we had after joining Sotheby's. Wow. And so every agent in our office, when they send a referral to Vail, most of them are sending them to Ty because they know him. I mean, you know, the, the funny thing about Ty is just also being a likable, approachable guy who's, he himself has done over a billion dollars worth of real estate. Sure. All right. Sure. And so Laura and I in not this last August of 20, but of 2019, we went and dropped Maggie off to college Mm -hmm. here at Fort Collins for Colorado State University. Oh, that's great. Oh, yeah. She's majoring in having a good time. I can tell you (laughs) that. Uh, But it was interesting is what we did is we booked an Airbnb for seven nights Uh uh, there in Breckenridge with the goal of we've been hunting for a mountain house for a long time, all over, all over the U.S. From we were actually very close to pulling the trigger in Big Sky. Because when we had that that skiing uh-huh. skiing networking right. event right. up in Big Sky, we just fell in love with it, and so we were like, "Well, let's look at other places." So we booked an Airbnb with the intention of trucking out a couple of hours to the different mountain towns, Steamboat, Vell, uh, Beaver Creek, all of them right. around, right? right? Just to try to see is there one that would be a fit for us. So here it was. Uh, I can't remember the name of the community. Uh, we we pull in, we're driving around, we're looking at houses, and there's an open house. We were like, hey, let's just go in here and take a look at this. As we come to the front door, I hear a voice, and I was like, that sounds like Ty. And as I get in there, there's Ty uh, ha- holding hope in his own open house on a Saturday. And it was just really cool. He was like, yeah. Ty. And he was like, man, what are you doing? I said, man, we're shopping for a house. He was like, what about this one? I was like, hey, man, a, a house, but I can't afford this one. I said, I'm just in here to snoop around and check it out. But he was just a super approachable guy. And then Chris in Aspen, actually, I use what he said at that G&E as part of our business plan. Uh Is he, you know, he talked about it then. And then I talked to him more offline about it. I said, man, did we get a bronze medal in the downhill for the U.S. Olympics? I mean, it's a pretty big deal, right? That's a pretty big deal. Pretty big deal. And I said, man, how do you train for something? How do you do that? And I believe that business gets complicated when you complicate it. Sure. Right? Life gets complicated when When you complicate it. Right. (laughs) Or a pandemic shows up and says, I'm going to complicate it. Yeah. And I said, what do you, like, how do you train for something like that? And, And he goes, look, my dad broke it down for me to be real simple. Plan your path, ski your path. When you deviate, that's when problems happen. And he goes, but you can practice skiing your path and change the path to practice as needed to become better, faster, stronger. And that rang with me that that is, I've probably talked about that on, I don't know how many episodes. And it was really interesting because COVID forced us to really look, well, actually we had had a process that we wanted to do prior to the pandemic, but 
sometimes industries can be very antiquated. Right. And even real estate. And we had consumers, clients that didn't quite understand what it is we were trying to do. And then the pandemic happens and they're like, okay, this makes total sense. <laughs> right. right. And so as we were refining this process to make it better for the client experience, um, plan your path, ski your path, we deviated only twice because of me saying, let's make an exception for this client. One, we ended up losing the client. And the other one, we ended up closing a deal, but it was literally getting across the finish line, kicking and screaming. So it was that reassurance that I still use to this day. Can't even say it's my own. I got to give Chris Klug the, 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 the props for this is plan your path, ski your path. Problems happen when you deviate right? Now, it doesn't mean don't go try new things. Don't try, you know, you can change and alter your path, move that goalpost forward or backward as needed, but make sure you're practicing that path before you deploy that path right. because right. problems can happen. And it was bad for us. It was bad for the client. There was, at the end of the day, there was really no winners. And, and I, I hold myself incredibly accountable for that because it was me that agreed upon that. What I should have said in both of those incidents is, I understand what it is you're looking for. That is not our process, but let me help you connect you with an agent that is more willing to do what it is you're looking to do. What's an example? I'm, I'm not quite following. Sure. So one of the things that we do when we get a new client uh -huh. is we require them to take cultural index survey, which you took for us, uh, I think it was about a year ago. Okay. And as long as you answer the survey, with candor and integrity, it takes like six minutes, 10 minutes longest. The results show us how you process information. Okay. And the reason that is important to us is because unanswered questions create confusion. Confusion creates fear. And as we know, fear causes problems. Clarity creates agreement. Agreement builds trust. And for us, trust is a currency of business, not money. So when we're able to communicate with people, I think of it like foreign languages, right? So learning Mandarin, learning Spanish, learning Romanian is if somebody comes here and you got the old bubba, well, if you're going to be in America, you need to speak American. Well, hey, listen, if somebody doesn't understand the language, they just don't. Well, there, you know, real estate has got so many different things going on that if I can present the information in the way that they prefer to process information, right. that establishes trust. Right. So a prime example would be this, and I know you won't be surprised by this. Laura and I have very different culture index results. For me, give it to me in three bullet points. I just need an 80% solution. Tell me what time it is, not how the watch is built. And I'm probably going to make a decision before you finish your sentence. Whereas Laura is, I want all the details from A to Z. She wants the I's dotted, T's crossed. She wants time to process it. And she's very detail oriented. So when you're talking about two different, right. that's, so if I'm trying to present information to her the way I would, that's going to be bad. Or if somebody would, the same way, if somebody was trying to present information to me the way they would with Laura, I'm going to be bored. You've lost me and I've moved on. So this has helped the speed of trust. Sure. And what that's done is, so an example was, is we had a client that was like, look, they call me, to look, look, I, did, I didn't just want to go look at houses. I really... I just want to buy a house. I really don't want to go through all of this. And I said, okay, let's do that. Well, what ended up happening is we weren't able to present information in a way that they could process. And they wanted an experience to be completely different. What I should have done in that moment is stop and say, tell me exactly how you want to go do this. And I can set you up with another great agent in our office that is more likely to deliver that service the way you want it. So that, does that, is that, yes. a, is no, that I really point? understand. Yeah. Yeah. Now I would almost say that probably most husbands and wives or couples of some sort uh, have different, different personalities. So do you find that you work with the kinds that communicate like you and Laura takes on the other people or no, no? what we've done is we've taught the team how to speak all the different languages. So we can look at the results and say, hey, in this particular situation, this is what they're going to want, right? So for example, there's four main traits that are assessed in it. Autonomy, 
um, introversion versus extroversion, right? So need, want, desire, social attention, right? right. Um, pace or patience, and then conformity or nonconformity. So if we have someone that has a high sense of urgency because their C trait is to the left and not the right, then we need to give them information quick. We need to get an answer out of them quick. Matter of fact, they want to give the answer quick. Right. But someone like, so naturally I have a very, very low C trait and Laura has a high C trait. So with her, you're not going to go, so do you like the house? Yeah, you know, I think so. Do you want to buy it right now? With her, that's going to be, whoa. But with me, it's like, yeah, screw it. Let's put in an offer, right? <laughs> so, so that becomes important. So now that we've been able to train the team, mm -hmm. right, is in a lot of real estate teams, when a new client comes in, they just get handed off to whoever has the availability for many teams. Ours is structured where you get the entire team to serve you. So everybody knows how to do everybody's job but everybody specializes in a particular avenue, right? So Lynn, based on her culture index, she loves doing the contract and paperwork side of things. And with her culture index, love Zoom, not so much on the face-to-face. -face. So for her, showing people and prospecting for her is like drinking kerosene or being waterboarded in Guantanamo Bay. Then you've got Lynn, who based on her culture index, is she loves to be around people and she's very detail oriented as I like to call her persnickety, right? Uh, but she's very, very good with the clients, but her energy is better spent being that FaceTime boots on the ground rather than doing the paperwork. That's not the highest and best, but also going and finding new leads is not the greatest strength for, or it's, it's yeah, not the greatest design, right? Yeah. And then here's Laura, you know, who's got a law degree. That is who we call the the train conductor, right? Right. She makes sure it stays on tracks. She makes sure the train stays on time. The I's are dotted, T's are crossed, and we're hitting all those important dates and checking all those important boxes. And Robbie, this is going to shock you. I'm sure. I'm not a detail oriented guy. Really? No, no. Oh, no, I'm no. so surprised, Jeremy. When I look at a real estate contract, I literally throw up in my mouth a little bit because it requires me to stop and focus and make sure all the details are there. And I love the interaction of recruiting new clients or getting existing clients, because especially in today's day and age, it's not like 20 years ago where you bought a house and you stayed there for 20 years. We right. see a lot of people moving quite a bit Right. where I... That's not the highest and best use of my time. So we all, even though we know how to do each that's other's great. jobs. No, that's great. We can we can be hyper-focused on what we're good at. And we're able to, I mean, you're able to see our results, right? We've been doing more and more business each year, each year. And even entering 2021, we are already in the pipeline to set to close over $10 million. Very good. In the first quarter of 2021. Very and good. we're able to do it, not only because I believe we are very good at what we do, but everybody's performing in the function that they most prefer. That's what you look for. That's yeah. what you want. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's been just a, you know, and, but that was also the other thing I love about this industry and I love about Briggs Freeman Sotheby's is I have that entrepreneur you know, spirit and courage and, and I have a trailblazer you know, culture index that I wanted to try and do new things. And really my whole life is I'd always work in industries where walls and barriers or choke leashes were put on me in here. I could just run like a thoroughbred. Now, the good thing is, is I have Laura who is very, very detail oriented. It says we can't do that. And I'm like, why? She was like, cause I don't see you doing really well in prison. So we're not going to do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> see, as an entrepreneur, I want to break all the rules, but none of the laws. Right. 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 Yeah. So it's go. been, it's been just super exciting and yeah. fun. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's so good. let's, let's go back a little bit in time here. All right. So real estate has been in your blood for, in your lineage for quite right. some time. Right. Yeah, so right. Tell us, tell us about that. How does, how, how, where, where does real estate come from in you and your family? Well, as I said, uh, my, uh, um, my dad started the real estate company in 1960 and real estate was really different back then. 
Uh, he had like 12, 13 agents, I think. They were all really lovely ladies. They all belonged to the right clubs, and they were socially connected. But the, um, but the way they did business was they sat there by the phone and waited for people to call them. I mean, yeah, they got out a little bit, but it, it, it wasn't the entrepreneurial business that it is today. And, uh, and my degree was architecture. I have a master's in architecture that I got at Tulane. And I, but halfway through school, I kind of didn't think that architecture was going to be my calling. Uh, one, I was married, had a baby, and I was making $10,000 a year. And I was like, you know, this isn't, it's, it's not all about money, but I do want to provide for my family. And, uh, and I, and I love architecture, but back in the seventies, when I got out of architecture school, late seventies, uh, architecture wasn't on, it wasn't a cutting edge business. The buildings that were getting built and, and the Metroplex were being driven by the bottom line for a developer. So they were putting up glass blocks uh, big, tall glass buildings, really hardly any design. It wasn't exciting. Uh, I wasn't get paid well, even though we were working for uh, one of the largest uh, developers in the, in the country. Uh, we were doing most of Trammell Crow's work, but uh, it still just wasn't exciting to me. And uh, so I literally knew that architecture, I did it for two years. And then I, I just one day just said, you know, went to the manager, said, you know, love you guys. You guys are great that y'all have been so good to me, but this isn't my, my career. And he turned to me and he said, well, you are going to go into sales, aren't you? And I said, sales, what? And he goes, yeah, you need to go into sales. And I had a real estate license just because I did. I, you know, I, I had taken a summer course at SMU and gotten my real estate license. And uh, so I, I went to my dad and I said, you know, I'm really not interested in real estate. But if, if it's okay, just because I got to put food on the table, pay my rent and, and buy diapers, uh, can I come to work? And he said, sure. And so I did. I started having no intention of being in this business, a little bit like you, Jeremy. I kind of came kicking and screaming. And yet, just like you, I, I ended up falling in love with it. And I particularly fell in love with, you know, innovation. Uh, we were on the, you know, back in those days, every Friday you got delivered these MLS books. And that's what was on the market. It wasn't a computer. It wasn't, you know, it was, you know, these books that put ink all over your fingers. There were no cell phones. There were no fax machines. We had one of the crummiest copier machines you could even imagine. And, uh, uh, and I went and got a pager. Why did I get a pager? Well, because uh, you'd come back to the office and there'd be a stack of pink slips there for people that had called you. And I didn't really want to come back at the end of the day and have a stack of pink slips to go home. I wanted to go home and see my wife and our little boy. And so I've got a pager so people could start paging me instead. And I'd stop at a seven 11 and call them back. Well, the other agents in the office thought that was the strangest thing they'd ever seen. And then I forced my dad to buy a, the first fax machine and it was terrible, but it was progress and then I got one of the first cell phones and, you know, my, we had one secretary at the time. She smoked like a locomotive and she sat there on a manual typewriter typing the contracts. And I went out and bought her a IBM Selectric and thought we had done, you know, just gone into the space age. But so I've always been interested in innovating. And so uh, that part of it, was intriguing to me. Training agents became intriguing to me because they would all come to me and go, how did you do that? How did you get that listing? And I, I, and, and that went along fine. And I, you know, began doing very well selling real estate. But the thing I noticed was uh, a lot of the agents would say things like, well, his dad gave him that listing or he, you know, that just came to him because his name is Briggs. And I, I went, you know, that's not the case. My dad never gave me anything. He just put me out and said, go do it. 
And, uh, but I just decided then that I would not compete with the agents. Uh, we had a growing family. We ended up with five kids. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and, a, and an agent, they're on seven days a week. That's hard to be that family man and do that. Uh, so I really be, took more of the management role. It's not 100% a Monday through Friday thing. I'm still on at night and weekends some, but not like an agent is. And uh, so I was able to be with my family, coach soccer, coach Little League, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, uh, and that was important to me. So, I, you know, actually agents make more money than anybody in management. It's just a case. And so I forwent uh, the dollars for a lifestyle, and I've enjoyed it ever since. That's been a great love of mine is just running the company. I am a rainmaker. I love bringing in business. I love bringing in developments and being involved in them, but I refer the business out to the agents, and therefore I always felt like I was able to recruit the best agents because they knew they were not competing with the principal, which you know, in many cases, the principal of the real estate firm is the top agent of the firm and they keep all the best listings and they keep all the best clients. And that doesn't happen at our firm. I, I, I am involved. I know what's going on. I'm going on a, a, a listing appointment today with two agents from our South Lake office on, you know, after a, 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 a big listing, that's how I spend my time helping them, knowing who all's looking at whatnot. I sent out an email this morning to an agent that I know is looking for a big, a big lot. And I told her what other agent in the, in the firm had, had such a, had such a beast that would work for her client. So I stay involved in that level, but I am not a day-to-day sales agent and I love it. And that's what, you know, you, you talk about different talents and different uh, abilities I think that that's how I'm made uh, is is seeing other people succeed, uh, seeing our company succeed, uh, getting in the trenches when need be. Um, you know, spent the most of the uh, morning yesterday with agents that are talking about a new development that is going on in the Dallas area. And uh, so I was working with the developers. And there again, Jeremy, just like we're talking about the um, – the uh, strength of the the uh, brand. Uh, yesterday's meeting was with the developers and their uh, financiers, and the financiers were out of California. And um, you know, I was able to tell them, you know, anytime you're going into a new market and you want data and you want information about the the city, I know the players in every major city. So call, feel free to call me anytime. And, you know, it's that kind of thing that builds a relationship with important decision makers across the country. And uh, so I enjoy what I do. You know, and interesting enough is while you were sitting there talking, I did pull up your culture index. Ah. Uh, And I'll show you everything you're saying makes complete sense. And what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll I'll, read it to me. Yeah, I'll read it to you. (laughs) So it measures four traits. You know, like I said, autonomy, need, want, desire, social attention. Um, or social acceptance, pace and patience, and in conformity or nonconformance. So you are left of the center line on the autonomy, which means you're a we player. It means you process better when everybody is on board. Yeah, I love right? that. Yeah. So as I like to describe it, it is if you went to the track and you were getting ready for a track and field meet, people that are to the left of the line like to wait till everybody gets on the line, everybody gets in little skids. Everybody gets into position, get ready, get set, go, boom, gun goes off. Everybody starts the race together, right? Right. That's when you process better. Now I'm a to the right guy, which is I'm going to start the race before the gun goes off. <laughs> <All right. laughs> your, your B trait is you're on the more, it can be seen as extroversion or as, le- as, as we, we like to joke around with Le- Laura and I is when you're to the left of the line, like her, you could be friends with a cactus and a rock and totally be okay with it. When you're to the right of the line, you're like a Labrador. Look at me, see me, pet me. Let's go play. Let's go have a good time. And then your C trait is to the right of the line is patience. And your D trait is to the left of the line 
which is nonconformity. There you go. So your innovation, hearing you talk about yeah. this, I was as you started talking, I said, I'm going to pull up his culture index because this, I've got to see if the words are matching the wiring and 100%. Yeah, they Everything are. Everything you said. They as a matter of fact, Stanton Williams, who's my consultant for Culture Index, if he's listening to this right now and pulls up yours, he's going to go, this is, you're, you're doing in alignment with exactly how you're wired. Right. And um, and that's, man, that's just really cool because, but let's come back to that technology component for a second. Sure. So as you said, back in the day, there was a book, these are the listings. And then, you know, prior to two decades ago, you had to use a real estate agent because they were the only ones that had access this to the information. Right. Technology changed that. Right. Where anybody at the thumbs of a smartphone or a computer or a tablet or whatever can look at anything and everything out there. And now fast forward to where we are in present day. That's one of the biggest challenges of this industry is these disruptors, that innovation that is, some might call it, some people call it an attack on our industry. And even I am guilty of using that word when that's not the intention of my word is no, it's actually forcing us to the learn change. how to do it better. Right. 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 So what, are, what, tell us a little bit about like, what do you think about these disruptors and, and is it something that in our industry we should be concerned about? Well, it all depends on what you mean by concerned. Uh, you have to be aware because you have to adapt. Uh, do I think that uh, that just online searching is going to replace a real estate agent? Not yet. I haven't seen that work that way. And and I'll give you a good example. My son just bought his first house. He's a uh, uh, um, he lives in Portland, Oregon. And I, of course, put him in touch with a real estate agent in Portland, Oregon from Sotheby's. And, uh, uh, and they began sending him, uh, setting him up on uh, what, what good realtors do is put them in a position where they're starting to get pinged every time there's a new listing in the area that they want in the price range that they want, et cetera. And so Chase was getting all those pings and none of them were interesting to him until one. And so then he calls his agent and they go see this house and it is the house they want to buy. So he only looked at one house and that's what the difference is today is uh, um, you don't have to drive and meet on Saturdays and everything like you used to get in somebody's car and be totally dependent on them telling you what, you should be looking at the client is in the driver's seat. He's, he's looking at what's interesting to him. He knows his neighborhood that he's interested in all of that. But did Chase know the process? Not at all. He had, you know, you said a little while ago, people used to stay in their houses for a long time. They still stay in their home uh, on an average of four or five years. Wouldn't you say, Jeremy, and that yes. about right? So yes. they're going to stay in there. How good are you at anything you do once every five years? And especially in a world that changes every single day, laws change, processes change. Uh, that's where the real estate agent comes in is they're in this day in, day out. They see nuances that just the uh, computer doesn't see. They know uh, what's going on, and and a and a good agent's going to give that kind of input and and uh, to their clients. Plus, they're going to walk them through the whole process. They're going to walk them through negotiations. They're going to walk them through inspections. They're going to walk them through uh, getting a, getting financed. I mean, my son, you know, he's a very smart guy. He's an executive with Nike, and uh, and yet. Um, he didn't exactly know how to get a loan. He didn't exactly know how to do any of the things. And, and, you know, he's calling me at night going, well, this is what came up in the inspection report. What do I do? And, and I, and I told him what I could tell him, but even my knowledge is local. 
I don't know what some of the nuances are. You know, in Texas, we know we have soil that moves and you have to have certain kinds of foundations and, you know, you need to be watching out for termites and things like that. I don't know this, the, the soil factors in, in Portland, Oregon. I don't know if they have termites or if they just have carpenter ants or whatever. Uh, so a good agent is there to, to guide their client through the process uh, and certainly they also even, and we know this to be a fact too, spe- especially in a market like we're in now where inventory is low, they may know things that aren't on the market and the computer's never going to tell you that. So, uh, they may know that so-and-so on such and such a street, which is exactly what you're looking for, has made some indication that they might sell. You know, during uh, COVID, we have sold so many houses that aren't on the market. And uh, right now, our biggest uh, influx of, of clients are coming from California. We are seeing so many people come from California. And, uh, and with a low inventory, you have to be very creative and figure out what is possible for them to buy. They're willing. They're able they're ready and there's no product. So, uh, you know, a, a good agent is aware of what, um, what might happen. What, you know, having talked to somebody two years ago that said, you know, I'm probably going to stay in my house until my kid grows up. Well, you know that that son is just now graduating from high school. So you go, well, I think I ought to call them. They might be ready. That's the thing that a computer will never do. And so you still need really good qualified agents. That's my opinion. So, and I want to preface this with, I do agree with you. So like, even when we bought our house in Pagosa Springs, Mm -hmm. right? Four walls and a roof. We know, right, for the most part, it's four walls and a roof. Location, whatnot. But we used, even though... Laura's got over 20 years of experience. I've got a little over four. She's got a law degree. I got an MBA from TCU. Like I, you know, I like to think we're pretty smart. We still utilized an, an agent. agent for a couple of reasons. We found out real quickly that contracts in, in, oh, in, in Colorado were much different. We didn't understand a lot of things, but even more so, we used my charity. So there's not a Sotheby's in Pagosa, Pagosa Springs. Springs. There is in Durango. Which you probably saw a couple of weeks ago. We closed the referral out there for two million dollars that go. we sent to Katie Strum. So I'm giving her a little shout out. She did an incredible job for the client uh, and just did wonderful. But even when I reached out to Katie to say, "Hey, Pagosa Springs," she went, "Look, I I could probably help you, but that's a little out of my wheelhouse. That there's a lot of things I don't know about Pagosa Springs, which is an hour from Durango." Right. And so we got connected with Mike Herity who has his own real estate company, Pagosa Source. And we learned, like we had a house looking through on the technology, right? Mm-hmm. We were like, what about this one? He's like, uh, here's some things you need to know about the covenants that uh-huh. are out there, that there's nothing that prevents somebody from building something really, really strange and junky right next to you. And then eventually showed us to our subdivision, which hey, he got me good. I said, I don't want to spend more than X. It's a second home. And then we weren't finding anything because again, limited, there was no, no, uh-huh. no supply. And he goes, well, let's go look at this one. And I was like, uh-uh, how, how much is it? He goes, well, let's go look. And I was like, no, no, no. I, I like to do that to people too. No, let's not do that. And he was like, let's just go take a look. And he does show us one hell of a house. Mm-hmm. Now, Laura is a very, as you know, unemotional person, right? For logic, very straight to it. So I felt safe going ahead and take a look at it looking around. And of course the house stares at Pagosa, at Pagosa peak, right? It's, I mean, talk about the million dollar view. And I turn around and I see stars in Laura's eyes and I turned and I looked at him and I said, I'm in damn trouble. it, Mike, how much over budget am I going to be? And he goes, yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> but we ultimately ended up getting the house. We're incredibly happy. And it, we were we were very pleased with our purchase and investment. But when the pandemic happened, I normally when there's a strain on the economy, the secondary market 
is usually what is affected. Not right? this time. Nope, not at all. It became different. And I was thinking that based on history, right? Because I'm a, I am ai like to, to assess data. Now, there's no crystal ball in this world, but more so than not, 95% of the time, if you look at data and historical data, it will kind of give you an aperture of what to look like going forward. So I kind of expected that same thing would happen. So I was a little concerned for my own home value. Actually, that value is skyrocketed because the technology of today's day and world and Zoom and everything else, people are like, you know what? I can't go travel. I can't go do this and that. I'm going to go buy a second home where now I can go escape there. And so we were the recipients of that benefit where there was little, no inventory. So Mike did us really well there, which made me, of course, you know, with that MBA looking at the world from finance and ones and zeros made me very happy. But um, is still going back to after the pandemic as the world changed, right? So you got commercial real estate where that's going to be affected, right? We're yes, seeing it, is. We're seeing yes, it, it is. affected. And actually the desire. It's not going to go away. No, no it's no. It's just people's, you know, we just moved into brand new offices in Dallas and we love them. I still say that we love them. But had it been post pandemic, I'm sure they would have been different. Yeah. I'm sure they would have probably not been as big. Uh, we're not seeing the agents come in as much. We all miss it because the synergy you get in an office is very valuable. We're moving to new offices in Fort Worth. Can't wait. In fact, after I finish this, I'm going to go see the progress. And fortunately, finally, they're making some progress. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> I love it that that our new offices Everyone in Fort Worth knows where they are because it used to be the Hallmark shop and everybody knew the Hallmark shop. So we're, we're going to be right in the middle on the bricks in Camp Bowie. So I'm excited about that. But we also have a very, it's a very collaborative setup. Uh, you know, uh, the main thing is built around a, a kitchen. Uh, help me. What, what are we going to call it? It's, it's a place where everybody can go and convene. Like a and common space. A common space that yeah. people can share and sit at little tables and, and, and uh, you know, talk about things. And then we even have an in outdoor space uh, just right outside of that that's, you know, on a pretty day, they can do the same thing. So it's going to be a fun office uh, and a great location. So back to what we were talking about, though. You know, you know this, um, probably a lot of the people that are listening don't know this, but in 2005, my wife and I and our two youngest children took a sabbatical and went to uh, Beijing, China for three years and spent that time working with street kids, migrant workers, uh, and other things more of an, on a kind of a mission, mission-minded thing. But never before did I ever appreciate a real estate agent like I did coming to Beijing? We had a, we had a great realtor. Um, we were just leasing because uh, we knew we weren't there for a long, long period of time. But that realtor was our lifeline. No computer. Yeah, maybe the computer could show us the apartment that we're going to rent. But no computer, when you move to a new location, and especially one where you don't speak the language. We showed up with two suitcases apiece. None of us spoke the language. We didn't even know how to get a telephone, We, you know, a mobile phone. We didn't even know how to, how to, you know, and over there as an expat, you need to have a driver. She, she had already lined us up a, a driver. She had already lined us up a housekeeper. She, uh, we had told her that what we needed was to be near the international school where we had um, signed up our daughters to go to school. Uh, she was absolutely our lifeline. She's the one that told us about what doctors to go see. Um, I, I mean, when I thought about it, it made me so proud. Um, you know, you said a little while ago about um, uh, people coming in, in different languages you learn so much living outside the country. Uh, here we were not speaking Mandarin. We all learned how to, but but at the time, we didn't speak any Mandarin. And you'd be standing in line at a grocery store, and the the teller would be talking to you in, in Mandarin, 
and I'd have no friggin' idea what she was talking about. And I know the people behind us thought we were stupid. And I, how many times have I done that in the United States, being behind somebody that English is probably not their first language, uh, and just assume that the person's dumb? No, they're not dumb. It's back to your deal about communication. You have to be able to communicate. So anyway, that that's an aside. I don't, I don't, I didn't mean to go down that road, but um, there again, that's what's so important about a realtor, particularly when somebody's relocating. You are their lifeline. You're the first person they meet in a in a in a new city, and you're guiding them, not forcing them, but you're guiding them in making the best decision they can make, and that's a very important role. And you said it to the point of communication. And that's actually something that today's day and world is missing a lot of is the ability to communicate. Oh, wow. Right. No kidding. Dialogue being able to look, you don't have to agree with each no. other, but you still talk. You still talk. And I have, so in my world, I have two circles, my finance circle, which is my private banker, my wealth manager, my CPA, my lawyer, I even keep a defense lawyer on there. Everybody laughs. They're like, why do you do that? And I was like, well, you just never know when something's going to happen, know. right? You never it's, better know. To, it's better. It's like an American Express card, right? And he's actually going to come on and record after you <laughs> that I keep on speed dial. It's, it's like an American Express card. Better to have them and not need them than need them and not be able to get a hold of yeah, them, right? Absolutely. Um, but then I have what I call my Fave Five. Do you remember the old T-Mobile commercial? You could have five people in yeah, there. You could call yeah. them for free long before you could call everybody yeah. for free on these things. And these are five people in my world that I rely on for perspective and advice that are not in my industry that I know are not going to tell me what I want to hear uh -huh. that we can have dialogue, but I trust them and I admire them that I know they're going to shoot me straight. And there's several in there and I've had a couple of them. Actually, I've had three, four, four out of the five is guest uh, recorded. And there's many times that we're going around and around because we just don't agree with that, but we have that, dialogue, right. right? Because that's where we move forward in today's day and age of social media. It just feels like a lot of conversation is very one directional and not two way. Absolutely. And, and we believe that the, really the secret sauce to our business is communication, right? It's what I call the value exchange. We have two core values in the span group, which is you must trust us and want to work with us. Just like we must trust you and want to work with you. Because one-sided is lopsided, lopsided during the convincing business. And Robbie, can you really convince another human being to do something? No. no. Right? I don't have the time and energy to be convinced of something. And I don't have the time and energy to convince somebody of something. So as long as we have that first core value, then the second core value automatically happens, which is your money is going to be more important than our money. And that is very, very important because when you're focused on the client's money and not your own, your money's going to naturally fall. It's going to fall. It's going to follow. I've been on the phone with agents that were crying going, you don't understand. I got to get this deal to close because I got to pay my mortgage. And I'm like, well, are you representing you or the client? Right. 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 And so that was why, why communication was so important. But it's also being able to be agile and adapt to new environments. Like people in your generation and my generation you hear all of them go, well, you know, those damn millennials, right? I love, love millennials. And here's why. You just had to learn, had to adapt, right? So one of the GNEs, global networking events we went to, I think it was two years ago, when they had a speaker get up there and say, the largest transfer of affluent wealth is occurring in present day in the amount of, I think it was like 30 trillion or something like that. Some huge, crazy, some huge, huge number. number. Right. So math for Marines, I'm good at eating crayons, not remembering numbers, but it was, it was enormous. And I thought, well, wait a minute, that's that. And that's everything from super ultra high net worth to, Hey, I, parents passed away and now this money, I want to buy my first house, right. whatever it may be, trust funds, whatever it may be. And I thought, I just need to learn more is how do they think? And here's what, a, here's what we found. Millennials are going to find the house before you do, right? And it's funny because I laugh. I said, listen, we're going to set you up on a search just so you can see the coming soons because don't, those don't come out on all the apps of 
Zillow, Redfin, right. Realtor.com, or any right. of those, so you can at least see the coming soon. I tell them, you're like, you're, you're the one that has the time and the obsession and knowing exactly what you're looking for. You're going to send me a link to just a, so why fight it? Why resist it? Why to convince them to look at something different, right? And I said, but one of the things we learned about that transfer of affluent wealth is they grew up with these smartphone devices. Like, that's why I was laughing a few minutes ago. You were like, yeah, I mean, when, when I got a pager, right? We don't even know what a pager. They're like, is that in the Smithsonian? Right, right. right. But they grew up with these smart devices where they're so savvy with them is what I learned. That's the that's also another great thing about Sotheby's having these networking events where you can go and hear these breakout sessions and great speakers to go, look, they grew up with a cell phone in their hand where they can find it. As a matter of fact, back in your day and my day, if we wanted to learn more about something, it was go to the library or the Encyclopedia Britannica. If you happen to have one in your house, they can Google it in two seconds. Right. But one of the things I learned at that event was they can Google all the information that they need in the houses that they're looking for, but they can't Google experience. No. And they want somebody with experience that they can trust, that knows how to communicate with them, because they're so used to living in a world where everybody's like, you're a millennial, right? And then they have us going, hey, how do we help you? How do we serve you? Where they are my favorite clients. Actually, I would say the most challenging clients is my generation. And the reason is, is it was my generation that did the dot-com booms and built these cell phones and everything else. So it became this, well, I don't need anybody. I can go do it on my own. And so I just learned to stop convincing people like, hey, look, I, I'm not here to talk you into being my client, right? I, I, if you want to work with me, value exchange, and I want to work with you, your money's going to be important more than my money. And we're going to go do this together. And we're going to deliver that value and service. And we got the brand of Briggs, Freeman, Sotheby's behind us to be able to demonstrate that, right? And so we love millennials. We love working with millennials. And they are, and they're coming to it. And then even more so to dial it down to go, look, a picture tells a thousand words and it tells a thousand lies. And how many times back years ago did we line up 20 houses to go look at and 80% of them, 16 out of the 20, the second you pull up, it's like, nah, it's out. Right. So we're like, hey, listen, we want to be hyper-focused on how to win the deal in a very limited supply market. And we can focus that energy if you'll just go drive by and eliminate those. So that way we don't, because there is buyer's fatigue, right? After you've looked at a million houses, you're like, I, I, now I don't even know what I want. Mm -hmm. So now we cycle it down to the four. Let's go look at that. What was it about those houses, the one that you want? And then we jump in there and win. Or even more so like we've seen in 2020, which was, hey, look, you're competing with all kinds of different offers. Let's get a backup offer. And it's amazing how many agents on the other side is like, what's a backup offer? And we're like, what? How do you not know what a backup? We do backup offers all the time. In the last 30 days, we've had out-of-town clients that have come in and we did backup offers. And the first offer fell out, not because of the house, because of financing. Anybody can get, Mickey Mouse under a bridge can get pre-qualified for a $500,000 house, but there's a difference between pre-qualified and pre-approved. So when you actually do got to go start checking the boxes and providing the information, now you don't have that. So I'm like, listen, it, it, Let's just do it in three, move to for and, and it happened to be the houses that they want. And they're super excited about it. And, and so we're out there winning for them, right? Yeah. And that's why, that's why is even in this post-pandemic world, you just, you got to be, you got to be agile and figure out like, how do we do this to win? But the real estate market is moving. So I put out a weekly email that comes out on Tuesdays, which has the latest episode of Winning Strategies playbook that drops, but it also has a headline of the week. Which is really funny is even in today's day and world, I have some of my closest friends. They don't even know where I am on the political spectrum. And they've known me for decades. Some of them try to make assumptions, but I'm like, listen, I put out a headline because I want it to stimulate thought. because I had some questions at it. I don't care if you have a left direction, right direction, center direction, whatever direction. I just want you to think because I want you to be educated on what's going on in the world. And those headlines are all over for different things. And then I put a book of the week. I read a book every single week. And I'm like, hey, this is a good book. And this is what you're getting the value you're going to get out of it. Well, I, I say read. I listen to them on Audible, right? Yeah, so I'm going a million miles an hour. I don't have yeah. time to sit down and read. I can listen to it while I'm doing something else and go, wow, that's really good information. And then I put a snapshot of West DFW. 
So for the audience that doesn't live in the Metroplex, DFW Metroplex is 10,000 square miles. It's huge. And if you drew a line down the center of DFW Airport, I tracked the cells to the west of that going back to 2006. Right. In this last year, we came up 312 units shy of being a record-breaking year. And oh yeah, by the way, that was when everything shut down. And we were a record-breaking year. Right. And 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 so because even us in this market is when somebody wants to go to the east of DFW Airport, I connect them with an agent because 10,000 square miles, I cannot be the say all of end all in markets that I don't know and that are as we talk about, changing very, very quickly so we can get them connected there. And so the real estate market is moving. And like you said, we got a lot of clients that have come from California. A lot. A ton that are coming from California, which is adding even more pressure because they're selling their 1,500 square foot house for a million and then coming here and buying a 3,000 square foot house for 450,000. They're like, but I can I can overbid that. And it's just, it's just matter of fact, we had one, client that came from California and a house was listed at 415. Now this is a great house back up green belt, had all the bells and whistles, pulls and everything else. And he said, what do you think priced at 415? I said, look, I think it's overpriced by 15 grand, but it's going to have multiple offers and trade for even higher net because it checks a lot of boxes and there's a lot of demand or there's a lot of demand on a very limited supply client. He's like, man, no problem. I actually got a hundred thousand dollars more for my house in California. I thought I was going to get we went in at 500. Yep. We didn't win it. Wow. Yeah. That's how crazy some of this market is. So we tell folks, look, if you're waiting for that day to get a deal, all you're going to do is the same exact house you would purchase today. You're going to pay for that same exact house five to 10% more a year from now. Like Mark Dotzer, who does, you know, yeah. speaking, like look, you're just going to pay more for that house, because then you add on the pressures of lumber costs twice as much now. Supply chains have been interrupted. I had uh, Michael Dyke, who owns Village Homes. I had Mark Shelton, who's a who, who's a land developer. And they were like, "Man, this is there's almost we're almost running out of dirt to build things on." So even if you didn't have the double cost of lumber and you didn't have supply chain interruptions, it's becoming more challenging to find places to build. So they're having to go further out, therefore putting more intense pressure on. The current market. So I, I, I look at folks and say, look, this is not just buying a house. This is an investment for your future. And as we talk about is they might sell that house in five years. You buy a house for 300 and sell it for 450 five years from now. That's not bad return on investment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Sotheby's brand, and I want to make sure we don't miss this one. It's, this is what I love about Sotheby's brand. So ranch and land. It's gone great. This has been one of the best years ever for, yeah. for ranch and land. And, uh, you know, our group, they really, like I said earlier, they, they focus on uh, predominantly three hours in every direction. But at the same time, DFW has investors for ranch and land all over the world. So uh, this last year we sold a $30 million ranch in Colorado and a $30 million ranch in Nevada and, and uh, so, I mean, we we have been involved in a lot of big, big ranch sales. Um, one particular. Well, one, one particular. <laughs> yeah, a couple of years ago, we we sold the Wagner Ranch for. Uh, they were asking seven hundred twenty-five million, and uh, the sellers were very happy with what they got. So, uh, yeah, the ranch business is great, but this COVID has really. I mean, why not? If if you can afford it. Uh, why not invest in in land that you can go out and your family enjoy and and be somewhere close to, you know, one of the major metropolitan areas and you buy it by the acre and you sell it by the foot. That's that's the plan that these that most of the people that are buying ranches today are they know this you know the urban sprawl is coming their way, and so there's you know that land is going to go up. It's just going to go up. It may you know every. Real estate is the kind that, yeah, every so often you have a downturn, but you know what? Over a 10 year period, no, you don't have downturns. There's only so much land. Nobody's making any more of it. So uh, it's been a great, um, uh, a great part of our business. 
And, uh, and, and just like Jeremy, you were saying that you don't really go east of DFW. You refer it. Some agents do know ranch and land and they can handle it themselves. But what we predominantly see is that our, our residential agents uh, refer that business to a ranch and land specialist. They may work it in combination with one of them, or they may just out and out refer it. And that's the same with, we have a small commercial real estate division and uh, the residential agents really don't for the most part. I think Jeremy, you do, you've done some commercial, but uh, most residential agents don't really understand it. So they refer it to our commercial division as well. And you got to love the Sotheby's brand. So I have a great client who has helped me put Maggie through college. (laughs) <laughs> he gets bored and buy something every two years. Uh-huh. And so he bought a unique property down in one of the cities close to us, a little smaller suburb city, unique in the center of the city, 14 acres of land, an 8,500 square foot house, bought it two years later, bored, ready to sell it. And we were able to get multiple offers on that million dollar plus property and it was gone in seconds, right? And we navigated through the whole thing. So the other day, we get a call from someone else who also lives in a million dollar plus property in that same area that said, hey, I saw that. I want you to come down here and list our house. It's a brand, right? And then we've got a really, this is really, I'm, I'm so excited about this one is, sometimes we have people that leave Sotheby's. And I don't think that the grass is greener on the other side. And we have someone who left and actually <laughs> by an inch or by a mile or by default or not, it allowed us to be number one in Fort Worth after they left. <laughs> <laughs> but when that person, th- this client we have now, that individual had represented them in buying a property for $2 million. And now a couple of years later, the client had moved uh, up a little bit further north. And this is in an area where now he wants to list it for two and a half. I looked at the data and I said, yeah, well, that actually would make sense. But it's also in an area where that would be the highest selling house in that area. And there's, I mean, there, when you count for that geographical area in the last five years, there's maybe been three houses that right. sold over a million. But here's the funny thing even though the other person had represented them, they reached out to us. And you know what he said? Hey, I don't know what this other company is, but when we, when I started looking, I knew Sotheby's was going to list my house. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, that's great to hear. And he said, oh, but then I did my research and said, who's the go-getters? He did search. Now, this guy's incredibly successful businessman. I mean, this guy has got a level of business. He's forgotten more about business acumen than I'll even ever learn. Right. Super successful. And he said, not only did I know that Sotheby was going to do it, but I researched and found you guys were going to do it. And then he actually did what we love clients do is listen to us. Yeah. We got the house staged. We had a number of updates that were put inside the house. We listed it for, well, we'll just call it around the two and a half million dollar range. Right. Under contract in a week. Wow. Love hearing that. Yeah. Well, you know, the house that I'm going, I told you that I'm taking two South Lake agents to look at today. It's the same thing. That man called me and said, I live in a house that I know needs Sotheby's. They just know it. They know that you sure lots of realtors understand the local market, but they don't know where the buyers are coming from. And they want to feel like uh, they could come from anywhere. Um, the ranch division really benefits from that because, uh, Sotheby's is one of the few places that you can go to one website and look at ranches from Texas, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, uh, Australia, New Zealand, all over the world, Argentina. I mean, it's the one place that you can go. F- if, and if you're a ranch buyer, you may be looking at all those different places because you're looking for the, the right fit for you. And uh, 
you, you know, you can, you can find what you're looking for anywhere in the world on the Sotheby's site. Speaking of ranches is um, we've had a listing up there and we'll call it the Northern part of DFW Metroplex. Mm -hmm. And it was really unique. 26 acre property, pretty close to 10,000 square foot house was listed with a different um, brokerage. I got the lead because an agent named Brittany met us at a global networking event, calls me and says, I've got a lead. I want to refer it to you. Now, this is a, like, we knew this was going to be a hard property to move for a number of reasons that we don't need to make sausage out of. And the good news is we're getting ready to be able to advertise that that deal sealed and done, all finished, $2 million property. Great. Congratulations. And, but I wanted to also say, not only when we send leads out, but also getting leads, sure. right? So I was excited to be able to call her to tell her the referral check she was getting. She's like, oh, Powerball. <laughs> <laughs> but what I, the reason I wanted to bring that back around is also is in Fort Worth, there's not a lot of million dollar plus properties. Right. Right. Luxury real estate is in not only the eyes of the beholder, but the level of service that you get. So one of the things that we had to re-evolve ourselves is naturally more expensive properties stay on our social media circuit. So it looks like all we sold was really expensive luxury properties. Well, that's not all that we sell. No. We actually sell no. everything. Everything. We, we, on, in 2020, we did over $30 million in closings. And that wasn't made up from big properties. I mean, that was a couple of hundred thousand dollar houses, 200, 300, 400, 500. But the good news is, is when you get a Sotheby's agent, the, if you're going to buy a $200,000 house, you actually get the treatment that you would, if you were going to be a million dollar buyer. Right. That's true. And, 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 and it's, and it's all a part of that. So once we, I had to get my social media guy to go, Hey, you know, cause everybody thinks that it's, me on social media all the time. And I'm like, that's only 5% of the time. If you actually knew it's a five foot 10 black guy out of Nebraska, who's the <laughs> younger brother of my college roommate <laughs> who runs all my stuff. And I was like, Hey, we need to be putting this out there that that's not all we do because right. we found two years ago that I had friends that were like, yeah, I just bought a house. And I'm like, what, what, why didn't you use me? Oh, you only do big properties. No, no, no. Yeah, right. We do everything. Right. And so we were able to capture them in, bring them in because you're going to get that level of professionalism is um, you're not, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of great agents out there, but I do believe you get the creme of la creme when you come to Sotheby's. Well, Jeremy, another thing, uh, if you did go list a $150,000 uh, condo, you're going to walk in there and you're going to give those people the kind of advice that they need to hear to, to rearrange furniture, to rehang pictures, to maybe have to paint a room because we require high res photography on everything we put on our website. So you're going to be giving them good advice like they were a $500,000 million dollar listing and that way, other agents, when they come across a Briggs Freeman listing, even if it's in the $150,000 range, they want to show it because they know that it isn't one that the agent just put a lockbox on, letting it just, you know, be trashed. They're going to be proud when they show it, even at $150,000. It's going to be the best of what's in that class. And that's what I think the, the brand, it requires it. We expect it. We expect good photography. We expect good service. We expect those things and our clients demand it. Absolutely. Well, let's go back to 20 year old self. Now you've seen, I mean, from, <laughs> From pagers to computers and technology and everything else, you have seen it go through just about how many downturns and upturns, and you you've seen quite a bit over decades and decades, right? You've matter of fact, you've probably forgotten more about real estate than the entire company will learn over the next ten years. 
if you could go back and talk to, and, and and when I when I when I end cap with this question, I know that there is a million things we would want to tell 20 year old self, <laughs> but what 20 year old self, listen, I'm not sure that I would even be patient enough to even have that conversation at 20 year old self. But if you could tell 20 year old self, just one thing, just like God, either do or don't do this. Or if you, if you just listen to this one thing, your life will either be a lot better or suck a whole lot less. What would be, what would you tell Robbie Briggs, 20 year old self, if you could turn back the hands of time and go, this well you said in, in in a little while ago you talked about that uh your role is to take care of the other person's money the other person's desire um and then your money will come that's the thing that a 20 year old needs to hear is set your priorities right what is the most important thing your faith your family your friends, all the things that are eternal. And this pandemic has made us all think about those things even more so. And if you just take care of those things, the rest of it gets taken care of. You don't really need to worry. Uh, we, we have been through downturns. We have been through difficult times. You know, we all go through difficult times. But uh, in every one of those cases where we've gone through difficult times, uh, I've had to come to the re realization that God is God, God is good, I am not God, and I can trust him because he's going to be in my life. That's, that's what I would, I probably was told that, but like you said, I probably didn't listen to it. But I really want to, I, I would really want my 20-year-old self to believe it. One of my favorite sayings is, if you ever want to make God laugh, tell him your plan. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, there what you I go. love about that question is, with this series we're recording this week, we will have been over 30 episodes with Winning Strategies Playbook. And to date, no one has given the same answer to that question. Mm. That's what I've really gotten excited about mm. on this series is like, man, that's, that's just candor, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the essence of... Man, we, matter of fact, our producer, Aaron, it, it said, man, we could almost make, we should have just called this, what would you tell 20-year-old self? Yeah. Right? And, yeah. And, and so thank you for the candor in that. So people want to learn more about Robbie Briggs and Briggs Freeman Sotheby's International Royalty. Where do they go? What, what, what's, what, how, do they, how do they do that? Where do they go? Well, uh, the first thing, go to the website, www.briggsfreeman.com. That's, that's, you're going to see beautiful pictures, beautiful properties. Uh, we have lots of information on there about neighborhoods, about schools. Uh, so uh, that's, that's one of the first places. And then um, anybody can email me anytime, rbriggs at briggsfreeman.com. Yeah. I'll get back to them. Yeah. I, I, Robbie, thank you for coming in. And for anybody that wants to learn more information or what Robbie was just talking about, go to myexperiencedrealtor.com. That's experience with an ED, myexperiencedrealtor.com. Click in the top right hand corner of that landing page podcast. Scroll down to the great CEO of Briggs Freeman Sotheby's International Realty, Robbie Briggs, and you can hear this episode over and over and over and get great wisdom. Thank you for coming, Robbie. Thank you, Jeremy. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. What'd you think? Oh, you did a great job.